Hello NQ Jazz fans and welcome to this very special MJF edition of the NQ Jazz podcast. We are joined by the wonderful Nikki Isles, who alongside Norma Winston, Dave Green and Stan Saltzman would have been joining us to open the Manchester Jazz Festival stage for us this year. We're very, very heartbroken, of course, that the festival can't go ahead, but we're looking to reschedule all of our Manchester Jazz Festival concerts for later in the year, so please keep your eyes peeled for these amazing artists coming up to Manchester as soon as it's safe to do so. We're very grateful for Nikki for giving her time to come and talk to us today and discuss her life, career and music, some exciting upcoming projects, loads of different things. So sit back and enjoy the interview with Nikki Isles. Um, hello, Nikki Isles, and welcome to the NQ Jazz podcast. How are you keeping? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, in this uh, in the situation we're in. <laughs> yeah, very, very strange world we're now now living in. Obviously, this this is going out um, over the MJF weekend and Manchester Jazz Festival. And you would have been one. Of, well, you would have been opening the the festival program for us at the Whiskey Jar, uh, along with Norma Winston and Stan Saltzman and, and Dave Green. We were massively looking forward to that concert. So it's a it's a big shame it's not happening uh, now in May, but. We will we'll definitely be looking to to reschedule that for for as soon as it's feasibly possible. <laughs> um, but how how have you been finding life um, in you know, isolation, lockdown? Have you been keeping positive, keeping busy? Yeah, we have been keeping busy. I mean, thankfully, uh, you know, we're still finishing off our teaching at the Royal Academy and um, Guildhall. So um, it's been really nice being doing something positive and helping people through this. You know, it's it's you know it affects people totally differently and I think the first couple of weeks for me to be honest I couldn't even look at a piano I was in such <laughs> shock yeah. with all the you know there's all these lovely gigs coming up and a big tour and lots of things um so yeah it was a bit of a it was horrible at first you know and I think uh, it's quite good to be honest about that really you know because uh, a lot of people are finding you know they're trying to put music out there but I didn't feel at all like that <laughs> But um, it's bubbling up and I'm feeling much better. Thank you. Brilliant. I'm glad to hear that. And, you know, hopefully you know, things are, are easing as we as we go along and hopefully we'll be be back to well, some vague semblance of normality <laughs> within within the next while. Um, so, I mean, Manchester Jazz Festival has had a very long association with you. I think you've been one, one of the most active artists uh, with MJF over, over the last few years. And, you know, I, I saw your gig there, was it maybe two or three years ago with Josh Arcaleo and Laura Jones? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, think, I don't know if that was just a, a one-off lineup, I think, maybe even. Um, but that, that was a, a hugely enjoyable gig. And, uh, and the Printmakers, was that, um, was that debuted at the Manchester Jazz Festival? Certainly Steve Mead had a hand in putting that together. Yeah, the festival's been a complete, uh, you know, support for many years. And uh, Steve Mead, in particular, um, actually, yeah, he actually said to me, put together your, the band of your favourite musicians. <laughs> so it, it wasn't quite the band that I had it right at the end, but the core of it of Mike and um, Steve Watson, Norma, um, with, and Mark, actually, I think it was Mark. Yeah, Mark's on it. So that was, you know, you need people to help you put those things together because um, it's a bigger band and, you know, needs funding. So... Yeah, Steve was incredible, and uh, and again the the band with Josh. I did I did do I wanted to do a band with some younger musicians, and I was already playing with James. And uh, you know, it's that thing sometimes where you you end up booking your friends, and it's the same circles. Yeah. But um, I felt it was important, um, well, for me to learn and grow, as, you know, as well as meeting new musicians. And Josh is an incredible musician, <laughs> and yeah, no, I just wanted to make it a two front line. So I I work with. Uh, Laura on just little things like the Nigel commissions and so I thought it'd be a great opportunity so we we literally through it we wanted it to be quite spontaneous and uh, no rehearsal yeah it was a really fun gig and that that spirit of spontaneity was certainly there it was a yeah a huge huge amount of fun so I mean you to to jump backwards a bit maybe and take a, a running jump at all of this you uh, you started out um obviously is recognized as a, an excellent musician at a very early age but playing clarinet as well as piano i believe um and playing with orchestras and all of this so wh how did you end up transitioning into jazz what was the what was the thing that turned you oh, into the dark side as it were <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> left left center um yeah well a few things really i, th I th my dad was a, a semi pro jazz drummer um mm. he worked in the motor industry and uh so you know nat nat cole um sinatra you know ella louis 
it was on all the time. Yeah, there wasn't much happening at school that was jazzy, but I, I always really enjoyed tinkering, you know, like, um, trying to write things, you know, nothing official, you know, so I was always, piano was always there as the second study thing, um, hmm. but kind of messing around. So that, that kind of spirit of writing and improvising was, I think was always there from the start, but it was when I, <laughs> I went to, I was just the wrong, one road, the wrong side of the tracks um, in terms of secondary school, which is which, uh, middle school in uh, Bedfordshire. And, uh, oh no, it was the, sorry, the upper school. And uh, all my friends went to the um, Queensbury, which was the, the musical school. And I went to, I won't mention the name, but it was like the housing estate <laughs> comp. Yeah, it was pretty awful. Um, and the music provision there was zero. So it was really, uh, you know, I kind of landed there and didn't really know what I was going to do, but I was going, uh, I think I was doing Saturday uh, school at the Royal Academy. I was a junior exhibitioner there from the age of 11. So I was getting, you know, I was getting stuff outside, so it wasn't a disaster. But then a music teacher came from Jersey, Brian Willoughby, who just brought up a load of saxophones and we started having what they called the swing band. But he brought in people like Kenny Baker, Don Lusher, yeah. all these, you know, amazing musicians to play with. And we toured Jersey every year and the whole kind of community thing in the, in those jazz groups you know going on the road and i just i just loved it and then there was the classic thing when kenny baker came in um the pianists were sick so it was like right off you go you know and i i'm like i didn't know how to read chord symbols but uh i don't know i somehow got by and just loved it so that that was it that was the start of it fantastic yeah and then and so that that led you then i suppose at that time maybe options were uh, more limited in in where was actually putting on jazz courses. And you you moved up to Leeds to go and study at the Conservatoire there. Um, at, at the same time as uh, I think a lot of you know now very celebrated jazz musicians uh, were were also studying up in up in Leeds. And that led you you then stayed stayed around for for a, a good amount of time up in the north. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know making links with lots of great Manchester musicians as well, you know, Mike Walker and, and Andy Schofield, uh, as you mentioned before. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, it feels like Man Manchester's maybe a, a, a bit of a spiritual home for you as, <laughs> as well as... Uh, yeah, obviously London. yeah well, I think, I mean, uh, to be honest, we would have stayed in the North. I love the North and I, I still consider myself a Northerner, funny enough. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> Wap and class, but um, yeah, no, I just, I, I kind of, I felt at home there. I really did. And uh, um, yeah, Leeds, Leeds was great. You know, Leeds was, um, I still feel, it's funny, I still, although the teaching was fantastic, um, I still feel very homespun and glad to be in a way. Because um, I don't think I was quite ready. You know, I was, I was a kid playing in a youth band and that was it. I didn't understand, you know, <laughs> sort of, it's funny how you just kind of land on listening things, isn't it, without any direction at the time. Um, so yeah, it was great to just, you know, we were in until night, until the place shut every night playing, jamming and, uh, and, and music, playing was at the heart of um, that course, you know, it was all sorts of playing. There was a radio orchestra, there was a sort of Al Jero, big band, Thad Jones, mm -hmm. um, kind of, uh, more kind of West Coast bands and, uh, it was, and you just tried everything. And I think even the Webern, we had this, uh, you know, the new music ensemble I used to do with mm -hmm. Graham Hearn. And I think that thing when you're at college, well, even even when you leave, you know, that thing of trying not to really pigeon your hole at yourself at that time. You know, I think it was so important to try everything. And uh, and, and some of those things, like the Thad Jones band with Tony Faulkner, that, that stayed with me big time, you know, mm. and, and it's really kind of influenced how I've, um, you know, the larger ensemble stuff. So it was great. But then Manchester, I, I actually got a job. I said, I'd never teach. <laughs> 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 and uh you know i was ready to sort of go out there and play and um i was working at wakefield jazz you know with the famous wakefield jazz um with the great alex sykes who booked me on things i wasn't really ready for well, i wasn't ready for at all but he, he had faith in you you know and uh again it was just a it was a school of well the real not some of it was hard knocks um but some of it was it was you know on the stand learning and uh Again, I don't regret any of that because it's that thing, it's very hard to get that now, isn't it? Um, mm. Gigs that you're playing with um, Americans and yeah. the London big guns. So I met, you know, people like Martin Spee and Tim Garland and did it, yeah, it was amazing. Um, but then I, I, I ended up teaching um, the guy who ran the old Wakefield Jazz, um, uh, 
offered me well said do you want to apply for this job and it's I, I think it was like 16 hours a week and I was thinking right I could fit that into two and a half days <laughs> it's gonna be part-time then I could do all my playing but then got the job by the skin of my teeth and uh, then realized it was a full-time job you know teaching pre-retirement drama beats I mean it was oh right but when I look back now, I'm still in touch this was in old um, Ashton underline um, I'm still in touch with that team it was a fantastic thing to be in we were you know they're all pretty left-wing and full of ideas and uh, a drama department a media department and and uh yeah it was hard at first but then uh, a student a, a mature student that came on the course to do a level was a great bass player paul allen was mike walker's brother-in-law oh right, right. <laughs> paul was a really good singer and i had a steely dam band i used to run in um, for the music students and paul said do you want to come and do this little library gig and that's how I met Mike and then with Richard Arles, my husband, um, we started that band Eminon and that was a fantastic platform. Yeah, oh fantastic and, and obviously education has become a, a massive part of your life ever, ever yeah. since really. You know? um, so you're a senior lecturer at Middlesex University which is you know, one of the foremost you know, university courses to go and study jazz certainly um, and Sam, Sam Leek teaches up there as well doesn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, and, and Chris Batchelor, yeah, oh, Gareth yeah, Williams, yeah. So you've got, got, got a fantastic team team working up there, and, uh, and yeah. also obviously very busy at, at Royal Academy, but also you've been instrumental in putting together the ABRSM uh, jazz for, for younger you know, education levels and, and all of that. Yeah. And, you know, so how, how over the years have you, I mean, you're quite a prolific educator, but also quite a prolific composer and performer. How, how do you manage to keep all of those schedules running concurrently? Well, it's, it's uh, through the hedge backwards sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but they sort of, um, they all feed each other, I feel. You know, I, I, I think I'd, I'd really miss the teaching, you know. And, uh, even the, again, I, I'm a sort of social, the music for me, I, I, it's very much part of being part of a family. And uh, you have your sort of, I have my printmaker's family, you know, and uh, then I have my, Middle sex family and that even even that it, I mean I obviously I love the teaching but that thing of going going and being in a very vibrant atmosphere you know you've got Dave Holland walking the corridors and mm. you know it, it inspires this inspires you you know and you have a lesson with some of these students and it's like oh yeah I've never thought of that yeah. <laughs> and it, it you know it's it's a, a two-way process I think and uh, I can't imagine either without the other in in, in some yeah. ways. No, fantastic. Yeah, the, the holistic musical whole. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So listen, it feels like a good time to, to jump in and play the first track that you've you've picked out for us, which is Beauteous Beast from, from the album Bells. Would you like to tell, <laughs> tell us all a little bit about that before we, we sit back and have a listen? Yeah, this was um, a band uh, probably post Eminon and, you know, the Manchester days, but also um, using Mike Outram, who is a great, um, somebody I met in Manchester, um, and Mick Hutton mm. on bass, who, who again, um, I heard many times with the John Taylor trio, and, and a friend I met um, through a band with Martin Speak, two Canadians, it was an Anglo-Canadian project, um, uh, Anthony McKelly, and my great friend Stan Solzman. So it's, um, and it was a commission from, by, from Sheffield Jazz, actually, and uh, so I thought I'll I'll choose something Sheffield based. So A.S. Byatt, I, I loved her um, sort of modern fairy tale short stories. That's the only thing I could manage with a busy, <laughs> busy <laughs> life. But, and I remember the, um, the, the Guardian reviewer, it was quite a funny tale really, but um, we, we had trouble with the sound on the, the initial gig with this, but, but they're quite bizarre little stories. And this one was about this big snake <laughs> thing that was in this pool of this, um, like a weird LA kind of, uh, those big houses with this um, David Hockney Paul type thing and and every time it was about this guy who was having this funny relationship with this snake in the pool and it, it ends up being a, a man so to these two men um, so I was telling the audience this story and the Guardian writer had come in halfway through and he just I got this terrible you know one of the worst reviews <laughs> ever <laughs> saying I was totally bizarre and uh, so but it, it, I enjoyed doing this uh, so this is, yeah, Beauty is Beast. Fantastic, enjoy.
Fantastic. So that was Beauteous Beast. Um, beautiful. So to pull back to what we would have been uh, listening to at the Manchester Jazz Fest, well, obviously you had your, your big band gig scheduled, which we'll have a little chat about in a bit. But for us, you were celebrating the music of Bill Evans. Um, so first of all, could you could you tell us a bit about why, why Bill Evans was... Uh, the composer that you picked uh, to focus on, because you know this isn't an isolated gig. You you have done a similar thing down at the Vortex, and, um, and Bill Evans has obviously been a big influence on you. But could you expand a little bit more on what Bill Evans's music has has done for you over your life? Yeah, well, it's funny. Even from the start, um, yeah, I miss I miss seeing him. Just by I was only eighteen, so I didn't get to see him um, on his last trip, but. Um, it was something, I mean, I love, you know, my first things like Oscar and Nat King Cole and all those, George Shearing, I love all those players. But there was something when I heard Bill Evans, when I, you know, you know when something really relates to you and uh, mm. even when he's playing bright things, it has a slight melancholy about it. A bit, a bit like Chet Baker or Billy Holiday's Kenny Wheeler. Um, and I think I've always related to that, you know, so it's... When I, I look back at the people I, it, you know, I love lots of music, but the things that really you go back to and back to. So I, I always loved his playing. Um, and it was the first things I transcribed and tried to understand, again, in my homespun way, you know. Um, yeah, anyway, I, th- I think it was that, well, as Kenny Willis always is the happy to be sad feeling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, all the musicians, you know, maybe Bill Evans isn't so you know in the last 10 years it's not you know there's so so much music out there it's not such a trendy thing to be into but um there's so many musicians that have come from that um his sense of harmony and it, you know his sense of rhythm as well you know people don't talk so much about that um and you know when you hear the the group playing in those even the early um portrait in jazz yeah 1959 or 8 wasn't it yeah um, you know, if you listen to Oscar Peterson trio, which we love, and then listen to the trio interplay, it's just it's it's a, just in another universe. I mean, it's just very it's totally different with um, equal voices and the improvising. And I, I think I've always loved that as well about the musicians that uh, improvise. You know, as soon as you start playing in the first eight bars, you can tell if they're really improvising. You know, do you know what I mean? That thing where you, you yeah, get yeah. people and you just you know it's not kind of running uh you know just playing playing jazz but they're everyone's listening with a in a really heightened way and norma is always you know norma uh if you listen back to some of her things there's just a lovely album out uh, quite recently it's a uh, it's been i don't think it was even issued but it was on a cassette tape um live at the guild hall there's a they did a just a lunchtime concert and it's let me fantastic um John Taylor and her and they do things uh, like High Lily High Low she's sung prologue in your own sweet way um, Porgy you know lots of things that were from that so is it, it's not a surprise really she loved him that you kind of have some meeting point don't you with people that have shared repertoire and, and even, even the albums I did with um, Martin speak Martin loved Bill Evans you know so again we're not trying to be Bill Evans but there's something about um, the way you approach things or um so it was it didn't seem it seemed she'd always said oh, let's do a bill evans project because she's she's actually um written words to things like elsa and uh, mm-hmm. prologue and it was actually claire martin funny enough who, who i um she's great very you know obviously a totally different kind of uh, singer but fantastic she said um right well isn't it's bill evans is oh, well, i mentioned it actually to her um <clears throat> we were up in ambleside at that festival and i said we should do a Tony Bennett Bill Evans because you know she's she's great like that and, uh, and she, it was Bill Evans's 90th birthday last uh, so it's, we're in the year of Bill Evans's 90th or yeah. the death of uh, um, Bill Evans yeah sorry um, so I did a, a gig at Pizza which uh, I did a load of arrangements um, more in the kind of Tony Bennett Bill vibe but then Norma's is a the different more of the original composition so it's been really good you know kind of a going back to tunes, finding different ways to do it. Um, and of course, Dave Green was around, met Bill and mm. and Stan Salzman um, was in and with Gordon Beck, um, Tony Oxley, they did uh, Seven Steps to Evans, which apparently Bill hated. 
<laughs> it's quite wild, but it's a fantastic. I mean, it's one of the things that introduced me to a lot of those musicians. So, it, you know, without even really thinking about it, you can sort of see with articulating it like this, how it's, it seems like the most natural thing to do. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that ties all the threads together wonderfully. And my my Bill Evans obsession was uh, for for about five years. I was just obsessed with Peace Peace. I oh yeah, yeah. On on loop over and over again. It's the most most gorgeous uh, progression from tranquil tranquility to angst and everything in in between. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, phenomenal musician. So I think it'd be lovely to to have listened to yourself and Norma playing some some Bill Evans. You've picked out uh, "I Do It for Your Love," and this is this is a printmaker's um, recording. Uh, so as we said before, this this has got Mike Walker on and Mark Lockhart. Um, is it Steve Watts and James Madron as well? Yeah, and it's yes, and this was one of the tunes we would have played on your gig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so sit, sit back and enjoy I Do It For Your Love.
atmospheres Love emerges And then it disappears But I do it for your love Um, lovely, so that was I Do It For Your Love, absolutely gorgeous. I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit now about your uh, big band um, experience and writing and, and all of this. Obviously, you were, had a, a really extensive big band tour planned, so you know I'm sorry to rub salt in, in the wounds at this stage of, of bringing it back up, but um, for, first of all, a, a phenomenal job on, on even just being able to put together a tour of that magnitude with that many musicians I, I don't think maybe, maybe since Guy Barker did his Amadeus project that was quite a you know a, a, a big sweep across the country but I, you know, not many people are putting together big national big band tours so you know a, a massive credit for, for that what what was the what was the tipping factor in thinking now is the time you want because you, you've been active writing for various big bands not not only your own um yeah. there was, you know, Stan Saltzman's Neon Orchestra, you know, doing doing parts of your tunes, and and as we'll see later on, you know, commissions for uh, for various places. So why why was now the time that you thought it, you know let's get everyone together and hit the road? Well, I think um, it wasn't a conscious decision. It, it was two years ago. Um, Kim McCarry Stone, um, she just said to me. <laughs> Right, here's the, we were just talking about things and uh, about putting something in at the Vortex. And I, I just said, oh, I'd, I really would love to do a big band. She said, right, here's the date, <laughs> get it together. And of course, really? I, I did have, um, you know, and sometimes again, it's like Steve Mead at the, you know, the Manchester Jazz Festival. You need somebody to just get behind you and set a date. And I'm, I'm good with deadlines, actually. Um, I think I'm better, um, even if they're, you know, pretty soon, I, I can work hard and it gives me a, that kind of impetus but um yeah so I, I you know I had charts from uh you know Nigel did a, um I mean it's a great band with Tom Barford and all um Connor Chaplin and all people like that uh Rob Luft were in it so it was you know I wasn't slumming it at all um, <laughs> yeah. um so I had some charts already and uh Tim Garland had um Mm -hmm. had uh, commissioned me for his un uh, northern under he had a northern underground when he was living up north um so i'd written a, a smaller thing with people like phil donkin and Gwil. um so I've, i i kind of reorchestrated some things went back with with um hindsight <laughs> and uh, hopefully improved them and uh and wrote some new things um and tried to think about you know the people in the a band you know i didn't i wanted people that were jazz musicians um and you know broad section of probably the people people that i've loved to work with over the years so it so it kind of looking looking at the uh the spread of people you know got henry lowther who's in his 70s and then harry Maund, who's still at the academy who's yeah. northern lad yeah um yeah who's great you know great uh, trom uh session uh, section player and uh mm -hmm. so it, it, i look at it and even andy schofield's coming over from prague to do the tour he's a big part of you know, he's a good, one of the best lead alto players I know, mm -hmm. um, but also very a great writer and you know totally understands um, what you're trying to do. And of course, Mike and Steve Watts at the helm in some ways. They're, you know, knowing them for ages. You don't have to talk about what you want because you, in, in a way, I'm, I want them to feel like they, you know, their personalities are, can really come out and take the music whenever he wants. But also, they they understand my music so that's that's amazing actually yeah yeah how did the decision come about that you were going to um direct and have Gwilym playing piano well actually <laughs> it 
it was a purely practical because you know getting 20 people together you'll know is is quite difficult but with all the great will in the world um we only we only managed one rehearsal for a lot of music and some of this wasn't that easy you know yeah not that easy <laughs> And, it, and I didn't really want to get that thing because it's it's that thing um, and it would come over a tour, you know, that when you're, um, you know, we get the notes right, but that's the that's the bottom rung of the thing, isn't it? And it's the next bit of what comes through the music. So I didn't, you know, that, that they did a great job on that first gig and got this little video, but, you know, but it's, it was the start. So, um, uh, yeah, it's... I can't remember what the beginning of this, the, uh, answer, the question was. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, I was just asking. Well, I just want more. <laughs> to, you know, to, to not be playing in your own ensemble. Oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah. So the first gig, we weren't, it, it just needed a bit of direction. But you'll notice on the video, a lot of the time I'm just bouncing up and down, enjoying <laughs> everybody's playing. And, you know, the last thing you want in as a jazz conductor is somebody conducting every beat, you know. So I, I was there, to, uh, to be honest just to help the, that first gig really, just the cues and everything. Right. So, and Gwil, I asked Gwil just to do Ronnie's because it, it was a funny one just for visuals as well. Um, and he was in town that, and I just thought it might be nice. Um, but I think I will play. Okay, great. Yeah. And so <laughs> obviously we're hoping, you know, of the lie of the land is very difficult to see at the moment, but uh, you know, yeah, yeah. at some point soon, you know, you're looking to to take the band and, and do a, a fresh set of dates. Uh, so. We will keep keep our eyes peeled, of course, and, yeah. and you know, spread spread the word when that's happening. Yeah. Um, now yeah. it would be remiss of me not to uh, yeah. ask you, having spoken about your your big band writing and and all of this, and also your educational work earlier. How did you get on in the Faroe Islands when you were over? Oh, we absolutely loved it. I mean, <laughs> it, can you imagine going to a, well? The, the, how beautiful it is, and but also it was just so funny that. Um, you know that 30 people were interested in writing for big band on a very small island you know and yeah. everybody came for the weekend and it was i mean it was, it was just lovely and to think that they actually wrote all that music and played it all in in for the competition and so warm and lovely so yeah we had a fantastic time yeah and, and, and also great for pete and I, just for pete and i to you know we're thinking our, our, our daughter's about to go to music college so well, that was part of my big band thing. I was going off to um, Prague to run the, the uh, dry dock big band there, direct them. And I was off to Colorado with Dave Holland and Nick Smart to the university, you know, taking your music. That's all been canceled, but it's a kind of really feels like a next phase. And the Pharaohs, we, it, we had a really big talk after that about actually doing more of what we wanted to do, you know, cause we're actually quite a good team, um, different kind of skills and um, about doing more, you know, Traveling yeah. together with what we're passionate about. Yeah. Oh, I'm. I'm. I'm so glad that um, we helped. Helped be a catalyst. Yeah. For, for it's great. And and so obviously for for the people watching who don't quite know what we're talking about, um, <laughs> my, myself myself and Emily um, here, we we have a, a regular relationship um, or a, you know a repeat relationship with. Uh, uh, son of a Bayek, whose surname I'm probably slightly mispronouncing, um, and some other musicians up in the Faroe Islands. Son of a um, programs for the uh, Faroe Islands Jazz Festival, Vetra Jazz, and the, we've done a few projects up there. Um, but they have a they've given a resurgence to their their Torshavn big band, um, and so they they wanted to hold a competition for some vocal big band uh, arranging, and they they asked who I would recommend for that. So I, I passed on. Nikki and Pete's details to go and uh, spread spread the big band love up in the Faroe Islands, and it's a really unique place, I think. Um, yeah, population of I think fifty fifty thousand or so across this you know mad network of islands. It's it's incredibly beautiful, and but but uh, the music scene is amazing. They they managed to make so much happen, and you'll have seen they they've just had their new music school built. I imagine that was just about up and running by the time you got there. Facilities are amazing. Yeah. But oh, better, no. better kitted out than half the conservatoires in the UK for sure. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So yeah, so um, yeah, a, a big shout out to to Sunover and everyone who's uh, up in the Faroe Islands there. So um, to to move on, but you mentioned there that Im Imogen Imi uh, is off to Academy in September, and I, I was quite curious as to you know when 
obviously, you know, she she's already a, a, a busy musician in a lot of ways. I, I saw um, uh, her playing with Pete and I forget the name of the guitarist at the the Green Note during the London Jazz Festival. Oh, Ben Barrett. It, so Ben Ben Barrett. Ben Barrett. Barrett. Yeah. Barrett. Yeah. yeah. And that that was a gorgeous gig. That was you know, really beautiful music. So uh, you know she's she's obviously already very active and very busy. But when the discussion came up about you know Amy wanting to go and study music and have a career in music with with two musician parents knowing all the the ins and outs and ups and downs involved, how how did that all transpire? Were you were you nothing but encouraging, or was there a bit of reality <laughs> thrown into the conversation as well? Well, we, well, it's funny we, we've because um, Pete's uh, parents were quite famous classical musicians, and mm-hmm. it kind of not put him off, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it sent him sideways into the dark side. Um, so you know, she's been around musicians. So we've really, oh, well, the, the, the most natural thing we could do with her was just to um, be hands off um, mm-hmm. in a way, yep. pushing her into you know some you know Saturday schools and all of that stuff so she's been around it and uh, you know she's come to you know come to summer schools we've been on as, since a toddler just because that's the only thing we could do because we didn't have any childcare and and of course musicians are wonderful to hang out with and she just kind of absorbed it so she always used to say I'm not going to be a musician mum and I said oh yeah I know yeah I know but it music will always be in your life won't it and um and it was only she actually did, Nick Smart advised actually that she try the NYJC summer school last year. Mm. So go and see what it's like to be with, we were really concerned. It was just our friend she's hanging out with, you know, she wants to be with <laughs> kids of her own age. I mean, there, there, there are some great kids at her school and I run the big band there. And um, But it's that thing of really, you know, kids that want to go on and do jazz. So it was great advice. So she came and, you know, took part in the summer school, which was great. And, um, she came home absolutely changed you know said right I want to do it and uh, now I think you have to follow your heart you know and uh, we're always going to be behind her and um, she's into so much music it's not just one little area of jazz you know she loves all the James Taylor Joni Mitchell songwriting and she's been going with Pete to the uh, Kadai. So I think okay. there'd be lots of avenues for her, I think. Yeah. So, I, and she's not, you know, she likes, she loves it all. You know, she loves Stevie Wonder, Dirty Loops, all this, yeah. <laughs> all these things and, you know, normal things kids like. But I think it's been interesting, you know, just not uh, push. I mean, all kids are different. I'm not saying always right. But for us and her, mm-hmm. I think it's let her decide herself. Um, and we'll be obviously we'll be behind her, but it's it's a it's a bit of a weird one going to just such a small thing, but she loves it. So that's that's what you got to do, isn't it? Yeah, you know, sure, for yeah. now. And she's she's certainly going going to a great place to do it. So I'm sure she's got a, a fantastic yeah. thing to head over there for sure. Yeah. Um, and she she'll be seeing <laughs> it'll feel like home from home. She'll be seeing a lot of yourself and Pete <laughs> around. She she kind of worked it out. Only an hour and a half with Pete a week, and I only have four lessons in the year with her. So. <laughs> <laughs> not too bad not too bad you can turn a cheek when she sleeps in the corridor brilliant so um the the final tune that you've picked out for us is um, a tune that you uh, were commissioned to write for for Nigel. this one was a commission um for the new album for Nigel. so it's not it's just just coming out it was featuring women composers um and I, I actually dedicated it to, to Jerry Allen, the pianist from Detroit. And, uh, and I called it Wild Oak, kind of thinking about her music for me. It's kind of totally rooted in, in the tradition, but then not <laughs> as well. So, you know, her and such an important uh, musician in our, you know, modern jazz piano. Um, so, yeah, and it features, um, I'm, I'm actually playing on it. Um, with Nigel and uh, Tom Smith, who is actually my copyist. He yeah, copied the chart. So I said, he's on second alto. So I said, if you copy it for me, I did pay him but a little bit, but I said, I'll feature you. <laughs> <laughs> That's and like it's, the uh, yeah. yeah, and it's the only thing, because uh, obviously I haven't recorded the big band yet. It's coming. So this is the only, for now, decent recording we have of um, one of the charts. So Fantastic. Here we go. Great, enjoy, this is Wild Oak. Thank you. 
So beautiful. So that that was Nigel sounding absolutely fantastic there, and Tom Smith as well, uh, who's been extremely active in lockdown. Uh, we should say as well, he's been doing loads of um, multi-track, multi-instrumental videos. So you should all go and check out some mm -hmm. you know, the amazing music of Tom Smith. And um, so, what what has the future got in store for you at the moment in the in the near and maybe slightly more long term? Yeah, well, apart from hopefully the gigs, you know, lots of the. Uh, pledges to get all the work back um, as much as we can. Um, but actually, um, just when the lockdown happened, um, there was a call for scores with the International Society of uh, Jazz Composers and Arrangers in America, which I'm a member of. A um, really good uh, group, you know, with Vince Mendoza and Christine Jensen and people mm. like that, uh, Jim McNeely. And it just said um, there were 10 commissions. So I, I, I thought I don't really stand a chance, but I'm going to have a go, you know, because we all just wonder, you know, you wonder about money. And and actually I got one, which is fantastic. And it was $500, um, but it actually um, kick-started me. So uh, another big, another big down piece. So, so that's been fantastic. Brilliant. And also a book, um, just finishing two books for the Associated Board called Nikki Owls and Friends, um, which has been fantastic. Uh, it's got many authors like... Uh, Willem Simcock, Jason Ribello, Zoe Rahman, um, uh, Kate William, Julian Joseph, Pete, myself, uh, Andrew Vacari, you know, so just lots of um, different authors. Uh, there's a kind of lower grades, uh, grade five, four to six, and then grade, up to grade eight. So some fantastic pieces. Great. Um, yeah. So they're coming, they're coming out uh, next year. Yeah, and Nigel have just called me to write a chart. They're, they're going online charts, but then take take the stems out. Actually, Wild Oak is going to be one of the, the charts they can... But they, they're commissioning some new pieces from people like Laura Jurd and Josephine Davis. And so so that's good, you know, to write something that's going to be useful. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> in, in society. Yeah. So actually, I, I love these things where you just got to, you've got to do a job and, uh, and yeah, get, slowly getting back to some piano practice. And uh, so, yeah. Well, fantastic. It sounds like lots of exciting things on the horizon. And the commission over in the States, how, how is that going to manifest? Is that going to be recorded and released or how? No, yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not even sure they know yet. At this point. <laughs> I've had the letter and the money <laughs> and uh, there's a deadline. So um, they said they'd be in touch. So it, I think it was a fantastic gesture, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, and, lot, and it was lovely, the, the 10 people that were, I was looking at the people, so you meet new friends, don't you, across the water. There's Aaron Parks got one, and then a younger um, musician, you know. So it was a nice, really a nice mix of um, Brilliant. writers trying to write for large ensembles. So it's, um, yeah, and that's just, you, you kind of reach out, don't you? Across yeah. the pond and we're all in the same boat. So it's, uh, it's nice, nice to just do something. We're lucky to be able to be creative if we can get in that headspace. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, so I suppose that's a that's a watch this yeah, space yeah. and see see what comes of it. Fantastic. And so to to finish up, yeah. um, you know, first of all, a, a big thanks for for giving us your time, and you know, it's been a pleasure to chat to you, and, and glad you're keeping well and and all of that. Um, what what are your top tips for for all of our listeners for lockdown? What if you could give any wisdom, advice, recommendations for what to do with their their time? What would you say? <laughs> Uh, well, we've been in the garden, like, allotments. Yeah, great. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's uh, again, it's that thing of um, doing something different, you know, reading reading books, watching films, and that, and slowly, I mean, I know for being a musician, it starts to feed your imagination, and, uh, mm -hmm. and also taking, I don't know, it's good, I think, for me, it's been good to take a little bit of a break, you know. Yeah. Um, so, don't don't be afraid of doing something it's not what you you think you're on the planet to do because actually you'll come back with renewed energy maybe yeah fantastic well listen nikki it's been an absolute pleasure thanks so much and uh we, we hope to have you back in manchester very soon in the flesh when yeah when when things allow so keep well and uh we'll yeah, thanks so much it's been really lovely talking to you thanks so much take care yeah. bye -bye. see ya bye Hello NQ Jazz fans, thank you so much for tuning in and checking out this special MJF edition of the NQ Jazz podcast. A warm thank you of course to Nikki for taking the time to talk to us today. 
If you are interested, please head over to nickyiles.co.uk or follow the links below to check out all of Nikki's amazing recorded output. There are some absolute gems in there, so you will not regret any of that. Also, please head over to our Patreon channel at patreon.com forward slash nqjazz to check out and support all of the music that we've been helping to create during lockdown, keeping musicians in employment in not the easiest of times. There are some fantastic concerts up there from silent movie soundtracks to duo concerts to some solo sets, people playing a whole host of music they might never have otherwise done. So please go and check all of that out alongside all of our other podcasts and we hope to see you again very soon. Take care.